Good morning or good afternoon if you're in the East Coast or good evening if you are in Europe or Turkey. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, this is our third What's Up in Ottoman and Turkish Studies meeting. Um, and I will just say a few words uh, and then I will introduce you to one of our members of the board. Uh, this year during our meetings I'll try to uh, make a point of uh, introducing you to our members of the board during the year so that you can actually see uh, the uh, both elected members of the board, the officers of the board of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Baki, Baki Tezcan, and I teach uh, history at the University of uh, California in Davis. Uh, what is very special about our meeting today, uh, the uh, today's What's Up, is uh, what brings our speaker, our discussant, and our chair together. They are, all three of them, imzaj. They are imzajlar. Now, if you happen to be from Turkey, you would know what this means. Uh, it means signatory, but... Uh, what does exactly signatory mean uh, since 2016? It primarily refers to people who signed a petition that uh, asked for peace, that demanded from the Turkish government that they go back to negotiations uh, so that uh, the war that has been going on in Turkey would resolve with peace. Uh, that, uh, that petition led to hundreds of uh, dismissals from uh, university positions, another set of hundreds of court cases. It received quite a bit of uh, for uh, quite a while internationally. And that international attention uh, seized gradually as the Turkish Constitutional Court finally dismissed the cases. However, the hundreds of academics who signed that petition and their jobs remain unemployed because the uh, ways in which they were dismissed didn't really tie it to any uh, court procedure. They were dismissed by uh, basically uh, presidential decrees or prime ministerial decrees that came in the aftermath of the Kalkishma, of the coup attack. Um, and the court cases, even though they ended, they didn't bring the jobs back. So hundreds of our colleagues are uh, unemployed in Turkey or in other countries like Europe, uh, especially in Germany. There are about 200 uh, in Germany who are unemployed and uh, uh, try to get fellowships year after year and after a while perhaps started looking for other ways of making a living. Uh, so uh, one of my goals in bringing these three people together today was to raise a little bit of awareness about the situation of our colleagues who are still unemployed in Turkey or in Europe uh, and many of them are also in Ottoman and Turkish studies, the organization that uh, brings us all together. And another, another message of solidarity perhaps is due to our colleagues at Boğaziçi University. I uh, would uh, encourage you strongly to check out the Committee on Academic Freedom of MESA. Uh, they issued recently uh, a letter, uh, actually two letters, one thing was on January 7th and maybe one was yesterday. Uh, and those letters are very informative about what is going on there. I would encourage you to have a look at it. it because of the topic, I thought today would be really uh, appropriate to introduce you uh, to my colleague, Asl Bobby. Uh, she is a first year uh, board member, was elected only uh, last fall. She 
he hit the ground running uh, at our board meetings, uh, the special board meetings on January 5th. Uh, her bio is very long and we only have an hour, so I'm gonna only tell you that uh, she's a professor of law at UCLA. Uh, she also directed the uh, sent director, of, she was also the director of the Center for Near Eastern Studies there. Her scholarship appeared in various prestigious law journals and she works on uh, constitutional issues, human rights issues that relate to Middle East and Turkey. But if you ask her what she is most proud of in uh, her bio, and this is what she said, I am most proud of my work in developing the Mesa Global Academy since 2017, a project to help displaced scholars their careers in North America. And I think uh, this, uh, this uh, pride of hers really connects so well with uh, the scholars we are hosting today. Asla, thank you so much for being here. Please, go ahead. Thank you so much, Baki. And it falls to me to have the great pleasure of announcing or introducing our chair, Melissa Bilal. Uh, Melissa Bilal is a historian and social anthropologist specialized in music studies. She is currently distinguished research fellow at the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies and lecturer in the Department of Ethnomusicology at UCLA. She previously taught at the University of Chicago, Columbia University, Boazic University, and the American University of Armenia, where she still works as a member of the core team developing the gender studies program. Dr. Bilal received her BA and MA in sociology at Boazic University, Istanbul, and earned her PhD in music ethnomusicology from the University of Chicago. She was a Mellon postdoctoral teaching fellow in music at Columbia University and postdoctoral research fellow at the Orient Institute Istanbul. Her recent publications include Lullabies, Lullabies and the Memory of Pain, Armenian Women's Remembrance of the Past in Turkey, which appeared in Dialectical Anthropology, an article that reads Armenian Women's Lullabies and Narratives of the Past as reserves of an affective memory and discusses their potential to critique the neoliberal memory politics in Turkey. Also, voice imprints, recordings of Russian Armenian POWs in German camps, 1916 to 1918, the Berlin Staatliche Museen um, in 2020 published a CD project that aims to bring into public audibility the Armenian experience in relation to musicology's colonial past. My heart is like those ruined houses, Gomidas Vartabed's musical legacy, which is a volume she prepared with Burju Yildiz in 2019 on one of the founders of modern musicology. In 2017, while a visiting scholar of history at MIT, Bilal co-launched the annual Feminist Armenian Studies Workshop and co-founded the Feminist Armenian Research Collective with Dr. Lena Ekmekjola. Ekmekjola and Bilal are also the co-editors of the book, A Cry for Justice, Five Armenian Feminist Writers from the Ottoman Empire to the Republic of Turkey, and are now collaborating on feminism in Armenian and interpretive anthropology, I'm sorry, an interpretive anthology and digital archive, a book which is in progress um, and will be forthcoming from Stanford University Press. Dr. Bilal is currently working on her monograph tentatively titled Wake Up Lullaby, Gendered Politics of Indigeneity, Music and Memory in the Late Ottoman Armenian Revolutionary Imagination, and the ethnographic research project, The Injuries of Reconciliation, being Armenian and Turkey. I hope you'll forgive me for having chosen a long bio for Melissa, but she is extraordinarily distinguished and we are very fortunate to have her as our chair today. Thank you, dear Asla, for this kind introduction. Um, I would like to welcome all to this event, which is especially special for me because it gives me the opportunity to introduce two intellectuals whose sharp critical minds and ethical political stances I very much respect. For me, this event is also a way of commemorating Hranting, the Armenian journalist who on January 19, 20, 2007, fell victim to an organized crime sponsored by the Turkish state, and also commemorating Sevak Balıkçı, the Armenian soldier who fell victim to a hate crime during his compulsory military service in Turkey uh, in uh, 2011. Uh, on the Remembrance Day of the Armenian Genocide. Reading John Atchikso's very neatly written ethnography, which I marked with underlines and this is it, exclamations all, of, all over, was emotional for me because I was re-witnessing the recent past in Turkey, which I myself painfully experienced. 
my re-witnessing was now mediated through an old and dear friend, a comrade, a classmate, analytical and powerfully articulate pen. I have many things to say about uh, how Sacrificial Limbs talks to my own scholarly work in multiple different levels, including affective, but I don't want to steal from our speaker's time. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Achiksos uh, and leave the microphone to him. So our presenter today is Salih Jan Achiksos, who is an assistant professor of anthropology at UCLA. His research focuses on the intersections of gender, health, and political violence in Turkey and the larger Middle East. His first book, Sacrificial Limbs, Masculinity, Disability, and Political Violence in Turkey, which came out in uh, 2019 from the University of California Press, examines the post-injury lives and political activism of the disabled veterans of Turkey's Kurdish politics. His new book project, Humanitarian Borderlands, Medicine and Terror at Turkey's Syrian Border, focuses on the political contestations of our healthcare along and across the Turkish Kurdish Syrian border. In addition to these two long-term projects, Dr. Açıksöz's work has appeared in journals including Current Anthropology, Medical Anthropology Quarterly, Culture, Medicine and Psychiatry, the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies and the Journal of Ottoman and Turkey Studies. Now we um, move to Jan Açıksöz's presentation with will uh, roughly um, last for 20 minutes, I guess. Thank you, Melissa, for this introduction. Uh, before I move on to my presentation, just give me a second to share my screen. And I want to show you some uh, slides, uh, including photographs from, uh, from the book. Um, so just I'll just share the screen with you and then start. Can you see the screen now? You can, right? Okay, perfect. Uh, so I'd like to start by thanking uh, Baki Tezcan and Ottoman and Turkey Studies Association for inviting me and also Baki for your important remarks on academic freedom in Turkey. And also thanks to Astabali for introductions, Melissa Bilal for chairing this panel and Leila Nezi for accepting to be our discussant. And thank you all for coming here and joining us. I'm very excited to be sharing my work with you. So I have only 20 minutes for introducing the book, which is kind of shorter than usual so that we have more time for the Q&A. So I will only provide you with a really snapshot of the book's arguments and we can unpack them further um, through your questions in the Q&A part. Sacrificial Limbs is a historically informed ethnography of war war disability, gender, and nationalist politics in Turkey. As the participants would well know, since 1984, the state has waged counterinsurgency war and deployed millions of conscripted soldiers against the guerrilla army of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK. And in the book, I share uh, many photographs uh, from uh, soldiers' war experiences, uh, which I analyze in chapter one. And uh, this is one of the photographs showing the conscripts walking on the mountains. And um, this is from 1996, taken during a military operation in which uh, several of my informants were wounded in uh, Turkey and northern Iraq, or Iraqi Kurdistan. So, um, and you can see these young men, you know, posing in the conscripts uniforms. And these, these young men, uh, probably around the number of five to six millions, uh, were conscripted and fought against guerrillas. And tens, if not hundreds of thousands of these young men have returned home with disabilities. Approximately 10,000 of these, these men have been officially designated as disabled veterans or Ghazis by the Turkish state. So the book chronicles the everyday lives and political activism of these disabled veterans, Ghazis. And it explores how veterans gendered and class experiences of war and disability are hardened into political identity and collective action in millennial Turkey. 
more specifically, the work shows how disabled veterans' efforts to recover their health and masculinities have historically been entangled with the work of an ultranationalist campaign against political reforms, minority rights, and Turkey's bid for European Union membership. First, let me say a few words about the book's methodological and theoretical underpinnings. And here you see a slide showing the research design. Methodologically, the book weaves together ethnographic, oral historical, archival and media research that I mainly conducted in Istanbul and Ankara between 2005 and 2008. Um, I had follow-up visits obviously to Turkey after that date and I conducted some additional uh, work research, but the bulk of my field work was conducted uh, during those dates and the book mainly focuses on this period. During that period, I collected life histories from disabled veterans, conducted interviews with military physicians and nurses, military officers, welfare bureaucrats, among others, and carried out participant observation in multiple spaces, including veterans grassroots organizations, military hospitals, commemorations, political demonstrations, uh, cemeteries, religious rituals, as well as in more mundane spaces of masculine sociability, like coffee houses and stadiums. Theoretically, the book is a bricolage, building on and bridging a diverse array of disciplinary and theoretical orientations, ranging from medical and political anthropology to gender and disability studies to historical sociology and political economy. I tackle many different theoretical questions in different parts of the book, but all in all, the work revolves around three large theoretical concerns. The first one is how can we understand violence as not only a destructive, but also a generative force that gives way to new forms of subjectivity, community and political agency through its embodied effects. So basically I look at how people embodying violence in their bodies and psyches, you know, develop new forms of community, uh, get used to new forms of embodiment, uh, have new forms of political subjectivities, which lead to new forms of political action. In the second level of my theoretical concerns, we have how do people become the political subjects that they are? And what is the role of embodied experience in the gendered process of subject formation? And I'm very particularly interested in political subject formation process. So the book focuses on the experiences of disabled veterans and the larger social, political, economic, ideological structures that inform these experiences to understand how they have become the political subjects that they are today. And the third question is, what is the role of sacrifice in the constitution of the modern regimes of sovereignty and state power? And obviously this is a very important question for me as well as for anthropology as a discipline. And this question gives the book its name, Sacrificial Limbs, which I'm gonna be talking further about in a moment. Here, uh, I don't have time or intention to address these really broad questions, uh, but for those of you who have read the book or uh, want to read the book, I think these questions will give you a sense of how I approach uh, the subject that I'm dealing with. So here, I'd like to briefly reflect on the title of the book and use it as a segue into a discussion of the book's specific arguments. I borrow the phrase sacrificial limbs from the nationalist state propaganda crib sheets in which disabled veterans are always hailed as quote, Gazi heroes who sacrifice their legs and arms for the indivisible unity of the state with its territory and nation. Those of you who are familiar with, with Turkish politics and constitution would immediately recognize the phrase, the indivisible unity of the state with its territory and nation. This is the uh, definition of sovereignty according to the Turkish constitution, 1982 constitution. And this phrase 
Um, Devletin vatanı ve milletiyle bölünmez bütünlüğünü korumak için kollarını, bacaklarını feda eden gazi kahramanlar is a generic phrase that you would hear from politicians, military officers, etc. Especially on special days uh, like national holidays, but also you know during ordinary uh, occasions when when these actors need to heighten the kind of national sensibilities around war and suffering and sacrifice, etc. The phrase sacrificial limbs also rhymes with and evokes the notion of the sacrificial lamb, which in Abrahamic tradition refers to an animal or person sacrificed for the greater good. That parallel between sacrificial limbs and sacrificial lamb is, is not coincidental because conscripts in Turkey are metaphorically and affectionately called sacrificial lambs, kınalı kuzular, in Turkish nationalist political culture. Finally, sacrificial limb resonates with another lesser known term, sacrificial leg. Sacrificial leg is an industrial term, uh, a term that denotes the replaceable section of a storage system, especially a warehouse storage system, a part that can be sacrificed to save the overall integrity of the more costly structure. And in that sense, the term is a very apt metaphor for conscripted soldiers' bodies, which are politically constructed as expendable and disposable for state sovereignty, illustrating the economic, uh, modern economic logic of state violence in Turkey. Sacrificial limbs, the term sacrificial limbs, and these kind of polyphonic uh, meanings behind it neatly captures one of my central arguments about the ultranationalist politicization of Turkish disabled veterans. Disabled veterans live a double life, uh, a double life that I unpack in the book, uh, as their bodies traverse two opposing regimes of value. In one of these regimes, they are lionized as Ghazis, as religionational heroes who have attained the highest possible spiritual rank before martyrdom, as saintly warriors whose place in heaven is reserved alongside prophets. And here, uh, there's a military propaganda poster uh, prepared for the day of Ghazi, September 19. And here you can see uh, the, the, the Ghazis uh, of the official uh, official historiography and state discourse. And on the top, you have the Ghazi of all Ghazis, Ghazi Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. And on the bottom, you have the different Ghazis, official Ghazis of the Turkish Republic, uh, Independence War, uh, Korean or Cyprus War. And on the left-hand side, you see a Ghazi of uh, Turkey's Kurdish conflict, who, unlike the others, is sitting in a wheelchair, right? And we can talk about why he's different from the other Ghazis in that regard in the Q&A part, why the others are not disabled, whereas he is disabled. And in the 2010s, in line with the neo-Ottomanization and, and Islamization of Turkish nationalist political culture, uh, new figures of Ghazi have been added to this uh, panorama. Uh, Ghazis of Ottoman sultans, uh, you know, famous uh, Islamic warriors, as well as the more recent Ghazis of the failed coup attempt of 2016. So this is the, the first part where they are, you know, exalted and, and lionized in state discourse and nationalist discourse. And this part may be particularly interesting for historians uh, here, as in this part of the book, I trace the genealogy of the term Ghazi, showing how its uh, meaning and political functions uh, have historically changed over the last millennium, an issue that we can address in the Q&A part. So the contrasting with this first uh, regime of value, in the second one, disabled veterans are stigmatized as dependent beggar-like men in a deeply ableist society and subjected 
to different forms of structural and symbolic violence under a rapidly neoliberalizing economy. And here you see a young man begging on Galata Bridge, a, a really important location for begging since the Ottoman times. Uh, and you can see the young man is basically uh, displaying his uh, dismembered uh, arm for the voyeuristic uh, gaze of the passerby so that they would pity him and give him alms, right? And disabled veterans in their everyday lives always have this anxiety of being conflated with disabled street beggars. And they use this anxiety performatively in their political activism very often, saying we're not beggars, we are Ghazis, you know, uh, change this welfare law, or don't, don't treat us as disabled because we're not disabled, we're, we're Ghazis. The gender tensions of this double life, you know, this double life oscillating between these two historical figures of the Ghazi and the, the, the beggar, the street beggar, steer the veterans' political activism as well as the narrative arc of my book. I trace the veterans' life trajectories first through counter-guerrilla warfare, then in hospitals and the textures of lower class urban life, and finally within wartime communities and political militancy to show how their experiences of leading a double life are politicized through ultranationalist conspiracy theories. Throughout the book, I follow a central tenet of feminist theory that gender is a constitutive element of social relations and power structures. I use gender as a lens to examine the ways in which the production of gendered and militarized bodies is knotted together with citizenship, sovereignty, and the making of the state. In Turkey, as you know, military service is mandatory. It's mandatory, it's compulsory for temporarily able-bodied men with the exception of openly gay and transgender persons. And as such, it is commonly seen as a prerequisite for young men's employment and marriage. Thus, this male citizenship practice has historically operated as a key rite of passage into heteronormative adult masculinity. For disabled veterans, however, conscription has failed to deliver on its promise of full male citizenship instead bringing socioeconomic marginalization and exclusion from wage labor and the marriage market and various forms of domestic and public citizenship. In the book, I describe in detail how disabled veterans' predicaments are subjectively felt and socioculturally constructed as a masculinity crisis for which the state is accountable. As I show in the book, since the 1990s, starting with the uh, passing of the anti-terror law of 1991, a wide variety of state and non-state actors and well, uh, have responded to this politically charged gender crisis through med medical, religious, and welfare discourses and practices that have aimed to remasculinize veterans and refashion them into productive and reproductive bodies. So this has been a concern for all kinds of different political actors, uh, even non-political, seemingly non-political or parapolitical actors, uh, celebrities, NGOs, uh, military officers, wives, etc., who have, you know, uh, developed all these different strategies, uh, incorporated all these technologies including technologies of the self to remasculinize veterans and turn them once again into productive and reproductive members of the society. Such practices target even the most intimate domains of veterans' lives, as illustrated by my discussion of the state-supported assisted reproduction program for veterans with paraplegia. Yet, these remasculinization efforts are by no means straightforward or unproblematic. I trace the quandaries entailed in this process across a variety of fields, ranging from nationalist and media representations to veterans' care and intimacy practices, to their welfare 
and political activism. Veterans activism is particularly important for the book's narrative because it is where veterans' gender troubles get tangled up with macro-political issues. By steering disabled veterans' arduous quest to recover their masculinities with ultranationalist agendas, political activism opens up a space in which disabled veterans can once again feel like masculinized subjects of political violence. I'd like to spend some time here on veterans' political activism as it speaks to today's political events on so many different levels. Tuesday, this last Tuesday, two days ago, was the anniversary of the assassination of the journalist Hiranting by an ultranationalist youth and the larger uh, networks that supported him and continue to support him in 2007. Hrant's murder was a direct result of an ultranationalist witch hunt that took place during my fieldwork and targeted prominent public intellectuals who voiced unorthodox opinions about the military, the Kurdish conflict and the Armenian genocide. Disabled veterans and their organizations played a critical role in these protests, a role that puzzled commentators, including the targeted intellectuals themselves. In the book, I reconstruct the history of disabled veterans' political activism, starting with the contentious trial of the PKK leader Öcalan in 1999, and show how these protests against intellectuals were undergirded by a cultural mechanism of sacrificial substitution, whereby disabled veterans' anger and resentment were channeled onto the scapegoated body of the intellectual. Pondering the historical continuity between protests against Öcalan and those targeting intellectuals, as well as the, the replaceability of the infidel, the communist, the Armenian and the Kurdish guerrilla at the level of political fantasy and political violence, I argue that the intellectual's body, especially Hrant Dink, replaced Öcalan as a surrogate victim in the eyes of disabled veterans. As a medical political anthropologist, I am particularly interested in the ways in which material symbols of disability, especially prosthetic limbs, became widely and inventively used in veterans' ultranationalist protests. One of the most effectively charged and usually striking protest act that I analyze in detail in the book is what I call prosthetic protests. The public removal of prosthetic limbs and organs, such as arms, legs, and eyes, which are then showcased in front of the media symbolically returned to state authorities or directly thrown at the targets of disabled veterans' protests. As performative acts of self-sacrifice that highlight the symbolic link between the dismemberment of the disabled veteran body and the alleged dismemberment of the nation, prosthetic protests have shaken Turkey during critical times of the Kurdish conflict such as during the trial of Öcalan in 1999 or during the peace negotiations in 2009. And this is a photo that was taken during the Öcalan trial in 1999. But we have seen similar uh, scenes during the peace negotiations in 2009 when disabled veterans uh, basically reiterated this political act protest form in, in a massive form. And then again, in the most recent uh, wave of peace negotiations, when they, they threw their prosthetic limbs at the Akil Adamlar Commissioner, the, the Wise Man Commission that was tasked uh, with, with uh, convincing the, the public to the necessity of peace negotiations. Prosthetic protests originally emerged within the context of disabled veterans' ultranationalist activism, but was quickly incorporated into the collective action repertoire of disabled veterans' welfare activism. After the neoliberalization of the Turkish welfare system 
and the privatization of the prosthetic, uh, prosthetic sector, particularly after 2008, uh, which marked the, the uh, Turkish welfare reform. Many veterans were faced with the possible repossession of their prosthetic limbs due to failed prosthetic payments. As a response, they once again turned to prosthetic protest form, using the metonymic political value of their sacrificial limbs to shield themselves from the economic violence of disabling, disabling market forces. And this is an issue that I analyze in detail in the last chapter of the book, uh, Prosthetic Deaths. And one of the most famous cases is uh, a case that involved a disabled veteran uh, that you see in this picture. And uh, he, was, uh, he was hosted at uh, multiple news programs and, and uh, news articles about him appeared in basically every single mainstream uh, newspaper. And here you see one of them in Milliet's newspaper where he has taken his, um, his prosthetic limb symbolically Resacrificing him uh, himself, and you know, basically uh, speaking against a kind of uh, new welfare regime and speaking against loan payments and other kind of uh, neoliberal measures that have been incorporated into Turkish health and welfare system uh, in the 2000, uh, 2000s. Sacrificial limbs examines such politicization of disability from a historically informed ethnographic perspective. Taking the body and embodied experience as analytical lenses, it demonstrates how veterans, self, community, and world-making practices in an ableist society get tangled up with an ultranationalist right-wing movement that weaponizes veterans' sacrificial limbs against those construed as traitors and enemies of the Turkish nation state. And ironically, after signing the famous peace petition, I myself joined the list uh, of those traitor intellectuals alongside uh, many of our friends here that my informants came to hate so much uh, and practically being banished from my own fieldwork. Amidst the global rise of right-wing authoritarian populisms and neo-fascisms, one of the animating concerns of sacrificial limbs has recently become central within the discipline of anthropology and beyond. How do right-wing nationalist movements manage to effectively mobilize whole groups of people, especially those who are most harmed by their policies? In attempting to answer this question, by placing violently disabled bodies at its center, Sacrificial Limbs provides an account of how a politically engaged anthropology could help us come to grips morally, intellectually, affectively, and politically with the suffering of those, those others, whose politics we find reprehensible, even inimical to our life worlds, political ideals, and understandings of truth and justice. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, John. Uh, now we are moving to our discussant, uh, who is Leila Nezi. Uh, she is currently based in the history program of the University of Glasgow at uh, Liberholm um, Trust Visiting Professor. She is also a professor in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabanji University, Istanbul, from where she's currently on leave. An anthropologist and oral historian, uh, Dr. Nezdi, uh, areas of research and teaching include oral history in conflict affected settings, memory studies, Kurdish studies, youth cultures, ethnicity and minorities, and finally displacement and diaspora. Dr. Nezdi has published widely in English and Turkish. Her most recent publications include the article, National Education Meets Critical Pedagogy, Teaching Oral History in Turkey, uh, that came out in uh, 2019 in Oral History Review. She is present, presently working on a book manuscript based on research she conducted with youth in Diyarbakir, Turkey. 
Um, please stop for me. Um, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, and I really want to also thank uh, Baki Tezcan uh, for this wonderful in, in, um, invitation. It's so nice to see people. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. And I have many things to say about this wonderful book. So um, let's see if I can actually say them all in 10 minutes. Um, as I wrote uh, in the review that I did um, of John's book, um, I've, I um, indicated um, that really um, I believe that this book um, puts Turkey um, on the map um, of world anthropology um, as never before. It really, um, uh, it really is um, so, so um, important. And um, I feel also that, you know, uh, John is part of a um, new generation of anthropologists um, from Turkey um, who are, you know, um, producing very um, wonderful new ethnographies. Um, some of these are published, some are in the process of being published, but, you know, we have like a, a whole new cohort here and it's a global cohort and that's very exciting. Um, at the same time, of course, uh, we do have this question about whether um, this kind of ethnographic work um, can continue in Turkey. Um, and that's, you know, something we might uh, want to discuss. Um, now, um, I have some comments about the book, which I'll sort of try and go through as quick as I can. Um, I think that one of the things that really distinguishes this book um, is its writing. Um, it's really a very uh, superbly written ethnography. And in anthropology, the, you know, there's a great deal of debate about writing and a great deal of experimentation. And we don't really talk that much about form. We talk more about content. So one of the things that I, if we have time, uh, I would love uh, John to address uh, would be the writing journey. Um, and I think it's also very interesting to think about, since we have, you know, many historians in this audience, uh, to think about um, how we are influenced by different genres. So, uh, for example, now while I'm trying to write, you know, I, I find myself uh, very inspired by history, uh, very inspired by fiction, very inspired by biography. Um, and concerning history, um, I think there's one thing that many anthropologists feel, uh, which John mentions in the epilogue of the book. And I think this is, raises a lot of questions about, for ethnographic writing. He says, um, you know, what we did as ethnography, um, you know, soon becomes history. Uh, what does this mean now in Turkey? I mean, you know, we have anthropologists who have worked in Turkey, um, where the place they worked has already disappeared. The place, the people that they, that were their informants have already been killed, you know? So, I mean, that's of course a very extreme example, but what does it mean, you know? Um, so what are those lines between what is ethnography and, and what is history in such societies? Um, so that's one question. And, uh, another thing, of course, that I'm sure you get asked a lot um, has to do with, you know, uh, you mention it, but you don't speak a lot about it in the book. Um, you know, this whole issue of uh, working with people that you don't agree with or don't necessarily even like, right? And, and also, as you mentioned, you know, the limits of fieldwork, where there's a point at which, you know, you feel that, you know, it's over right? You cannot be friends if you were ever, you know, friends. I mean, these are very complex issues. Um, the other thing, of course, is in your book, you make the distinction uh, between the center and the right, right? So in a sense, there's the, the state that disappoints these people, and then they move to the right. But of course, when we look at the present, I mean, right, obviously, uh, where they were is now the center, right? Um, 
and I just uh, what occurred to me again when I looked at your at, at your book again, uh, this figure came up for me uh, in the um, series that everybody has been discussing, right? Bir Bash Bir uh, you know, um, there is this commando figure Yasin, right? In that series, and in a sense, um, it's sort of like he's a hero. You know, he really, I mean, he's a very positive figure uh, in that series. He's a commando and, I mean, he's all, I would, he's not, I mean, he's almost a feminist, I would say, you know, it's very bizarre, very bizarre uh, portrayal and uh, very frightening, I would say. So I just, that just came up for me. Um, when I looked at your book again today, something uh, occurred to me, which I hadn't thought about before. And I got curious to ask that, um, which is, you know, you have these wonderful settings that you talk about, the mountains, you know, the hospital, the street, uh, the organizations, you know, it's just so um, incredibly evocative. And something just occurred to me where, you know, you're talking about the fact that these people are getting prosthesis, uh, they're getting fertility treatments, they're getting credit for homes, they're getting jobs, even though, of course, all of this is pr very problematic, not sufficient, blah, blah, blah. But there is this stuff happening and you're interested in the body and in gender and masculinity. So I wondered to myself, you know a lot about this, but uh, you didn't really write much about it. And I was curious about why. What about these guys as husbands sons and fathers because if they're getting these fertility treat treatments like what's going on at home right um, you don't really talk about sexuality reproduction in terms of like the man at home right and you mentioned for example domestic violence but you you don't really go into that so there's like it's just so fascinating and i really like wondered what's going on at home, right? This is very political uh, and it's very embodied and it's very gendered. So like, why? Um, like, I also wondered whether you might have had some ethical concerns, you know, in, in not writing about that. So let me see. Um, yeah. Um, so another thing is, you know, because I'm uh, very interested in the, the Kurdish experience, in, in a, inevitably, you know, I'm always making comparisons in my head and, you know, you bring this uh, important discussion of sacrifice to the theoretical debate on sovereignty. And of course, you know, um, there are other sovereignties um, so resistance movements also obviously are a form of sovereignty. Um, this could be the PKK, it could be, you know, the Tamil Tigers, it could be, you know, many other groups. Um, and, and it just occurred to me, these comparisons are also very interesting, right? Because um, in, for example, the PKK movement, we also have a very central focus um, on sacrifice. Right. I mean, sovereignty in in that moment is very much, but very interestingly, at the same time, it's neither Sunni nor masculine, at least in this course. Right. So that is a very, very interesting uh, situation where you have, you know, us, some similarities and some uh, big differences. Um, how can you, you know, in for you, sacrifice goes with masculinity you know in your case um while you know you can have other cases uh, where you can have sacrifice and not have um this traditional um you know sunni male um, culture you know that's very much sort of the dominant one um, which of course in kurdistan is also the dominant culture but you know we have a movement that's really trying to work you know, against the grain, but still keeping um, the concept of sacrifice. So in a way that sacrifice, you know, what is it? You know, how does it deal with tradition? Uh, you know, I, that's just occurred to me again, to, thinking about it um, today. Yeah, so um, am I on 10, 10 minutes now?
yeah um okay so i think i'll just leave it at that and we can see what comes up um, when the audience asks questions thank you very much thank you leila uh, that was wonderful uh thank you so much for your generous and insightful comments and questions and also for the detailed and wonderful review that you have written for this book which actually helped me unpack some of the ideas that were cursorily developed in the book. So I thank you for that. And I also want to thank you for another thing, which is a kind of more a broader kind of issue. Uh, you mentioned the new generation of anthropologists. Obviously, this new generation have uh, learned from the older generation, if I may say. Of course, that's not a nice word to, to use. But anthropologists like yourself, I mean, have been so instrumental in the creation of an anthropology tradition in Turkey. And there are others, but there are, you know, there are a handful of people uh, who have been instrumental in the, in the creation of a strong anthropology discipline in Turkey, despite the fact that there are not that many anthropology departments, especially anthropology departments teaching in English. Uh, your question about uh, the ethnography, the possibility of ethnography in Turkey, that remains to be seen. People are conducting ethnography still under these circumstances on fascinating subjects. But obviously in a country like Turkey, there are repercussions for academic work. And that remains to be seen. What kinds of repercussions are awaiting these people for the academic work? that they're carrying out. Uh, you, your questions were so amazing. I'll just try to be really brief so that we have time for, the, for others' questions. About writing journey, let me say only a few things. Um, this is an issue that has been discussed over and over again in anthropology, uh, how to write, how to represent, how to represent the other, what kinds of genres can we use the boundary between fiction and nonfiction, the boundary between, you know, autobiographical, autoethnographic writing and a more kind of formal objective form of writing, etc. So um, obviously, you know, we have all been dealing with these debates in our own ways. But for me, um, some of the, the interesting things that, that left a mark on my writing was my uh, familiarity with uh, something that was unfolding outside of anthropology, which is affect theory and the kind of different uh, experimental forms of writing that it demanded from, from academicians and others uh, writing on affect and emotion. And the other thing was that, um, there are many others, but one other thing was that uh, at, the, at the time of my writing, whenever I felt like okay, this, I, I need some form of insight. I always turn to literature as I was writing. And Kafka, not uh, very surprisingly, appeared as, as an important figure as I wrote, especially the chapter on hospitals, etc. cetera. You know, I always turn to Kafka for uh, insight there. Your comment about the, the boundaries between history and anthropology, the sentence that you quoted from the book also says, what feels like history keeps coming back in the present. So there's this kind of, you know, always, if I may say, the traumatic reoccurrence of things that we often want to think of, think as history. And obviously, Huran Ting's murder reminded us very, that very powerfully, right? I mean, things that we think as historical events are very much in the present, still unfolding, still continuing, still as open wounds. And, and in the Kurdish conflict too, I mean, for, for me, writing this book was really an emotional roller coaster because on, with on and off peace negotiations, for one moment, I would think, okay, you know, I'm saying these, but these are not relevant anymore. These are passé things, you know, these belong to Turkey's past. And suddenly in a year, I'm like, huh, okay. So they weren't really uh, things of the past, but they're very much uh, with us. 
Uh, so history and anthropology in a, in a setting like Turkey, you know, keeps uh, feeding into each other in, in unexpected ways. Uh, I'm currently writing another piece on working with people that uh, you don't agree with or you don't like, and particularly on the theme of betrayal in anthropological work. Uh, so what happens when an ethnographer feels like uh, he or she has betrayed her informants or informants think that uh, they have been betrayed or the state thinks that the anthropologist has betrayed the nation, etc. So I'm writing about the repercussions of this kind of uh, betrayal issue. Your comment about Bir Başkadır, uh, if you are interested, if anyone is interested in seeing how these new generation of TV series and films uh, depict uh, soldiers who fought in the Kurdish conflict or soldiers or paramilitaries or, or the, the special squads, uh, please check out the, the ser series, Netflix series, Buru, uh, which is Wolf, Kurt, which is the first fascist production that I have ever seen. And I mean fascist. Uh, I use it sparingly. It's not fascist as, as if I'm talking about, oh, it's militaristic, it's right-wing. No, it's fascist in the classical sense, and it's the only fascist production regarding uh, the conflict. And, and Beru is not a coincidence that it means Kurt, and it's the name of the special squad, the police squad. Uh, it's, it's extremely scary, so I highly recommend it if you can take it. Your comment about uh, sexuality and reproduction, uh, this is partly an effect of conducting fieldwork in a gender segregated setting. Uh, when we talked about, and, and also an effect of the fact that my interlocutors in the field always wanted to talk about political issues because that was the masculine public uh, thing to talk about. And, you know, I rarely had access uh, to, to their families. Uh, I've listened, uh, you know, contrasting with this, I've listened a lot of stories about sex workers, which I sparingly share in the, uh, in the book. Uh, interestingly, a female sociologist, Nurseli Yeşim Sümbüloğlu, who also conducted field work with, with disabled veterans, uh, because of her positionality, she had much better access to disabled veterans' families, also because of the po changing political circumstances during time she conducted her fieldwork. So she has been writing on this in a way that complements what I haven't been able to write about. And finally, about sovereignty uh, and sacrifice, you're absolutely right. There are all these competing sovereignty claims, and this is exactly the point that I make about sovereignty and sacrifice, how you know, sacrifice becomes shaped uh, at the intersection of these competing sovereignty claims. And some, one thing that I'm very much interested in, in the book and beyond is the, the mimetic exchanges between the state and nationalist movement and the Kurdish movement. And these mimetic exchanges particularly take place in the domain of sacrifice and death. Uh, martyrdom is the classical example, right? I mean, when you look at the discourses of martyrdom, there are striking similarities that, you know, uh, definitely uh, go beyond the differences that of obviously obvious differences between the Kurdish movement and, and, and the state or official nationalism. Uh, you know, we can talk more about the value families, their aileleri, the term Zilan Nashmak referring to this kind of feminine form of sacrificial self-sacrifice, etc., in the Kurdish movement. But maybe I'll leave that to the Q&A. Uh, and again, thank you for these uh, wonderful remarks and questions. So. Thank you very much, dear Leila and Jan. Uh, this discussion is especially precious for me. Uh, given the recent war uh, in, in Artsakh in Karabakh that we experienced, so it's, it's all very relevant, this uh, discussion about history, open wounds and uh, militarization. Uh, we have some time.
for uh, some questions and I would like to open the floor for questions. Please raise your hands or uh, paste your question to the chat. Uh, that, that was already a hand raised uh, by Burchak Keskin Kozan. Okay. Hello, John. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I finally get to hear your work and I have no excuse now not to buy your book. Hopefully an autographed one from you. Sure. Um, uh, so I think I would like to follow up on uh, Professor Nazi's comment about gender and uh, perhaps ask you to rethink gender as we conceptualize it as a, almost like an individualized um, ascriptive and social status, right? I mean, how can we think about gender in, within the institutions, such as family, as uh, Leila Hoca was mentioning, um, and how can we think about the sacrifices, the discourse and the practice of sacrifice on the family members of Ghazis themselves? So a story, I totally understand the gendered means of in excess, right? Gendered in excess for you as a male researcher to talk with, especially uh, about the topics of sexuality and sexual production with the family members. But how about say parenting? right? How are their kids are affected? How are their parents, uh, you know, dads and mothers are being affected? Let's think about family in a different institutional way and also think about the role gender shapes and is shaped by this, you know, I mean, uh, that's one comment. And the question is, could you talk a little bit about the class background and um, ethnic or other um, social identi uh, identity markers of the uh, Gazis you are talking with. Um, and connected to that, these are conscripts, not the military cadres. So would your findings be different if you were interviewing subais, right? Um, who were in a hierarchical position to really accept and live with this uh, sacrifices, mm -hmm. they are, uh, they have to live it, right? So thank you so much. I love it now. <laughs> thank you so much. Wonderful questions. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I take this, this critique, uh, definitely, you know, every, every work has limits and, and uh, you know, access issues. And, and uh, so, if there's uh, one of the most important uh, missing points uh, in the book uh, would be that exactly what you you talked about. For example, how their kids uh, perceive this kind of uh, notion of sacrifice. How, for example, they talk about it with with you know, their friends. For example, when they talk about their fathers at school in other settings, official or non-official settings, uh, parenting. This, especially parenting issue is something that I do not talk about in the book. It may come as passing, but it's not really an issue that has been discussed. And definitely there's uh, a lot of space there to unpack uh, you know, all these issues in different domains of social life. And also, as you said, you know, widen our understanding of how gender and nationalism and notions of sacrifice interact in different domains of social life uh, and shape people's subjectivities and sociabilities. Um, but I, I talk uh, a little bit about uh, family life as uh, Leila mentioned about the increase uh, you know, the, the kind of complaints about domestic violence, for example, complaints about drinking, complaints about, you know, wives and their partners, complaints about uh, they, disabled veterans, spending too much time with their, uh, within their homosocial uh, disabled veteran groups, etc. All these kind of things that threaten uh, families, right? And I also talk a lot about uh, how they come to build families, all these matchmaking stories, 
failed matchmaking attempts, uh, you know, trying to find a so-called suitable spouse who can become a, a suitable spouse for a disabled veteran, uh, whether it's a widow, whether it's a virgin, except all these kind of debates, uh, I go into them in, in the book. Regarding your question about the, the social backgrounds and identities of disabled veterans, yes, that's, that's uh, very, very important. Most of them, as you said, these are the, the, the people that I uh, give voice to in the book are uh, conscripts. I've talked to uh, military officers as well. Uh, but one thing is that most of the disabled veterans are conscripts. Uh, most of the so-called martyrs are conscripts. And there is, a, there, is a there is a political economy of violence there, as I mentioned. Whenever a military officer, or forget about a military officer, whenever a university graduate conscript gets killed, it's a it becomes a very different form of sacrificial crisis. Right? So the, the disposable category of conscript is the one who is hailing from a working class or lumpen proletariat, urban or rural background, right? Who has finished primary school, secondary school at best, right? And during my field work, who did not, and now of course it's changing because of social media, because regardless of your, your um, you know, school degree, et cetera, many people have access to social media and their lives, their intimate lives, their personal lives, their personal pictures are all online. So it, that kind of creates a new form of sacrificial crisis that wasn't really there in the mid 2000s. But having said all these, uh, most of my informants are hailing from, you know, working class or lumpen proletariat backgrounds, uh, if not all. Um, ethnically, uh, there's a wide variety of ethnicities, uh, but obviously in Turkey, uh, the, the main dichotomy is Turkish Kurdish, right? You won't have too many Kurdish Ghazis, and there are reasons for that, uh, main being uh, the state has been always unwilling to deploy Kurdish, and I made Armenian conscripts to deploy them in the front lines. And then, of course, there's this kind of politics, uh, unofficial politics. If your birthplace is in Diyarbakir, you won't be deployed in, in, in the Southeast, in Kurdistan. You would be deployed somewhere in the West, right? So, and then, of course, with the forced migration, etc., it has been harder to know who is from where. But we know that state has been very careful in tracking people's ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds, even a century after their forced or willing conversions, etc. The state knows the ethnic and religious backgrounds of the people and keeps track of them. Um, I only had one ethnically Kurdish informant. Um, and, uh, but you know, he was very much repeating the same nationalist discourse that you would hear on t television from um, Kurdish uh, paramilitary guards or Kurdish supporters of the Nationalist Action Party. They would say ethnicity doesn't matter. You know, this is about our nation, Turkish Kurdish. We are inseparable. You know, we have exchanged women. Uh, so, you know, we are Kızalıp Berdik. So we're like the, the nail and the finger. Uh, the, so uh, basically his discourse was not significantly different from my other informants. He was supportive of the, the uh, ultra-nationalist positions of my informants, although he did not personally attend to any of these. And the other uh, disabled veterans always saw him with some degree of suspicion, uh, which came out in the way that his injury narrative was contested by my other interlocutors. He had told me that he had lost an ear in a landmine explosion. My other interlocutors told me 
that he was captured by the guerrillas and his ear was chopped off by the guerrillas as a punishment uh, of, for his betrayal, right? So, and that reflects the kind of, uh, you know, the significance of his ethnic background in the construction of all these narratives and understandings of injury and loss and political subjectification. I should stop here, <laughs> but thank you for these questions. Um, yeah, the class and gender analysis of militarism is uh, so essential for us to, for us, uh, like peace activists, basically, to better understand uh, militarism and establish peace. Uh, if there aren't any questions from the audience, I would like to uh, pass the microphone to Baki Tezjan for his question. Melissa, thank you so much. I'm sorry I couldn't raise my hand because I think if the host, for some reason, I couldn't find the button. Maybe if I'm the host, I cannot raise it. John, thank you so much for this great presentation. I have two questions. One is comparative between Turkey and here, and then the other is comparative in Turkey over time. So in United States, we see a lot of uh, veterans actually taking part in anti-war movements. Um, is, is, are there, were there any veterans you found in your um, sort of interviews who actually had a critical lens on what was going on it is one question. And if there aren't, what do you think is different between here and there? I mean, here too, there are some who support white nationalism and who are Trumpist, but then there are also some who are very critical. I have classes about Middle Eastern history where a student comes who says, he was deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan and he wants to learn more. He has a very open mind and he becomes critical of the governmental actions, for instance. Is there any room for this in Turkey at all, as far as you can see? And the other question I had was, over time, do you see any differences? I remember Nadira Mater's book, uh, Mehmet in Kitabı, that was published in 99. That included a lot of interviews. Uh, has have things changed from 99 to when you were doing it, which is 20 years later? Perfect questions, uh, Baki, thank you. Uh, regarding your first question, uh, this was something that I was very curious about when I started my field work, right? In the book, I shared this moment when I, back in the, in the late 80s or 90s, when I saw this uh, born on the 4th of July, uh, you know, basically telling the story of the Vietnam anti-war uh, activist, a disabled veteran Ron Kovic, uh, which left, you know, a, a very important uh, mark on me and my understanding of war and peace activism. Um, in Turkey, you're right. I mean, here veterans have been involved both in anti-war movements uh, but also uh, in, in right-wing activism. I mean, actually, uh, recently we've had some uh, histor historic historical uh, monographs basically documenting the role that veterans have played in the formation of white power movement, uh, you know, uh, especially, um, especially highlighting the, the role of the post-Vietnam era in uh, the kind of, uh, in, in the way that veterans were drawn into the white power movement through these tropes of sacrifice and betrayal and etc. cetera. Um, in Turkey, uh, I do not know any anti-war disabled veteran, but what this statement means may be different from uh, what, you know, someone not knowing about what disabled veteran in Turkey means um, may, may think. Uh, Ghazi is an official title which is given to people who have a documented 40% disability, whose disabilities have been documented to be a result of their military service while they were operating under the commands of their military officers and whose disabilities have been caused by enemy weapons, okay? This is a very, very, very specific description 
of disabled veterans. So not everyone who gets injured, even if they were injured in, uh, in the Kurdish region would get the Gazi status. And Gazi status is a very politically charged status. It can be revoked. It can be, you know, many people have to sue the state to get the title. Uh, and there's very close state monitoring over the activities of martyrs families, about the ex-military personnel and disabled veterans. In the early phase of the armed conflict, there was an association in Izmir, which was kind of anti-war perspectives, which brought together families of killed soldiers and which also had veterans, but it was shut down by the, by the state. Um, and it's, you know, shutting, shutting down these organizations is very easy in Turkey because officially uh, you cannot really have any organization for disabled veterans and martyrs families and ex-military personnel outside of the four uh, official associations prescribed by the 1980 military coup. Um, in reality, there are many organizations but they operate under the shadow of this criminal ban. The stra state strategically lets them be, and they're very visible political actors, but any time the state can use that law and get rid of them. This is a very critical issue. Uh, and then of course, the, the, the overall you know, limits and boundaries of freedom of speech and et cetera in Turkey, and you know the the the, the larger political histories, etc. These are also very very different. Uh, there was only one informant of mine who articulated something akin to anti and not anti-war, but kind of a Sufi position. Uh, he was a, 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 an old neighborhood tough, had a really violent. Uh, youth had a really violent military service and turned to religion uh, and became a member of a tariqa and and uh, aside from his his membership in this brotherhood he had developed this genuine sufi attitude towards life and towards war and everything he was a nationalist all right uh, but he was not really willing to to uh, pursue any kind of politics of revenge in life. Um, that was a unique figure who would never find uh, any voice in the public. Maybe in times of political opening, like the peace negotiations period, when we had, we heard for the first time uh, from many critical, you know, uh, soldiers, ex-soldiers, veterans, etc. in the mainstream media, if this process had continued, we would hear from people. And people actually in there, when I talk to them in, in private, they would voice many, they would give voice to many different things. Like a common example that I give is that the real terrorists are not the PKK terrorists. The real terrorists are the ones in the government, are the, are the, uh, PMs and blah blah, uh, you know, is the prime minister, etc. We should hang, we should hang them. This is, this is a common. <laughs> this was a very common, uh, Levois sentence that I heard in the field. But then, of course, this is not something that can be publicly articulated. And my book is very much about the publicly and politically articulated sentiments and political positions. It's about the forging of hegemony. Uh, that's why I'm less I was less interested in those kind of instances. How things have changed. In terms of politics, many things are the same. The same old style militaristic chauvinistic discourse goes on that you, you know, all these things that we read in uh, Nadir's book are still very much there. Uh, the loyalties, on, on the other hand, have been shifting especially in 2010s, we have, uh, you know, this kind of increasing uh, 
loyalty or demand for loyalty around not only the state and nationalism, but also around the ruling party and the, the Erdogan, Erdogan himself, right? So the loyalties, when you look at uh, the discourses of disabled veterans that were showcased during the recent military incursions into Rojava, uh, these disabled veterans were saying that you know, basically they weren't talking about the nation. They weren't talking about, they were talking about President Erdogan and they were talking about their loyalty and allegiance to him in person. And some were referring to him as the Ghazi, the, the Ghazi Erdogan. Um, so in that regard, things have changed. Uh, another thing that has drastically changed, even through, since my fieldwork is the, the, the types and amount of welfare assistance and medical assistance, et cetera, that are provided to exclusively to disabled veterans of the Kurdish conflict. I mean, when in 2000, Turkey did not have state of art rehabilitation uh, centers. When the Bilkent Rehabilitation Center opened in 2000. It became one of the world's best in that regard. And when we come to uh, 2010, we have all these different facilities for disabled veterans that were not there during my field work. Um, there are all these new entitlements and rights for disabled veterans that were not there during my field work. But does that change the discourses around sacrificial crisis? Not really. I mean, they are, when I, when I analyze the prosthesis repossession cases in the 2010s, the ideas about state not doing enough for the veterans, et cetera, were still very much there. This time they were comparing themselves with Syrian refugees uh, whom they allegedly accused of, you know, getting much better welfare and medical entitlements and benefits from the state than themselves, right? So the, the same ideas were still very much in action. Thank you, John. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, if not... I, I can ask one more. Uh, John, I was really curious, You in your slides, there was something called Gaziler Günü, September 19th. That was the first time I saw that, because I'm not following this very closely. I don't remember such a day in my memory. Uh, so when did they come up with that? And what happened on September 19th that they decided to commemorate with Gazis? One question. And two, the Turkish translation. You know, Nadir Mater had to deal a lot with a lot of court cases uh, for her publication of that book. Uh, are you uh, having any negotiations with a Turkish publisher? Or is it going to be possible to see this in Turkey? Yeah, let me start with the second one. Uh, I don't foresee it in the near future, unless political circumstances in Turkey change. Uh, when I signed the contract with the University of California Press, I asked them to, so they basically asked for the global rights of the book. I asked them, yeah, it's fine, except the copyright in Turkey. I want to keep that for myself. Uh, and, and I really want to see it in Turkish, uh, except, you know, I have my family in Turkey. I uh, want to be able to travel to Turkey. Uh, I want to be able to, if possible, in the future, live in Turkey, etc. And um, there are other kinds of concerns that one, one has around all these kind of issues. So although I really want to have it published in Turkish, uh, not under those, these political circumstances. Uh, the, the, the other question, um, okay, I'm losing... My Gaziler Günü. Gaziler Günü, yes. What, what happened question. that name? What, what is it? So it's an invented tradition, like uh, some traditions are more invented than others, right? 
So Gazler, you know, so basically what happened in the late 90s, early uh, 2000s was that there were a lot of invented traditions and narratives around disabled veterans, around martyrs, etc. Uh, Islamic, they even invented Islamic, they even invented Quranic verses, to be honest with you. I mean, they basically inserted uh, the same, you know, like Ghazi into Quran as if it meant disabled veteran. Uh, you know, so all these things happen. Ghazi Lergin in particular, um, it refer basically it commemorates the day uh, Mustafa Kemal was given the Ghazi title, as well as uh, the, the Marashal, right? Was he, yes, Marashal status, Admiral. What would you translate it as Admiral? Uh, I think Marshal is- Marshal, yes, Field Marshal, Field yeah. Marshal yeah. would be. Yeah. So he was, that's the date he was uh, granted the status of the Ghazi and the Field Marshal by the Grand Assembly. Uh, and it was reinvented as the Gaz Lergunu. Uh, and I can't remember the exact date, but probably in early 2000s. Just like uh, the um, Shehit Lergunu, which used to be Chanakkale Shehit Lergunu, Chanakkale Martyrs Day, was also redesigned as a broader kind of Martyrs Day. And uh, they, they become incorporated into the official historiography and official uh, ceremonial realm. And Gaz Lergin is a, is a particularly important day for, for my own work. You know, on that day, uh, disabled veterans, alongside the other Ghazis of the uh, Turkish Republic, would meet in public circles. Actually, I had a good photo of it, uh, which I didn't include. But in the book, there's a, there's a photo showing the, the members of the official Disabled Veterans Association. And near them, there are also people who look much older and they are the Korean Ghazis. Uh, and they would be joined by military officers and politicians, etc. And depending on the vicissitudes of the armed conflict, this day can be highlighted in the media and official discourse or downplayed. So you can either see them in the first page of the newspapers or you will read a very small kind of thing in the back pages where they say, you know, the president uh, issued a statement, you know, congratulating or blah, blah, blah. So, so it's an invented tradition uh, that basically aim to garner more nationalistic and militaristic support uh, for the government and the military and the state. Um, if there aren't any questions from the audience, I want to ask uh, two short questions. Uh, the first question is, you don't mention very much um, in your book, but what is the these working class soldiers' relationship with Turkey's labor movement or any labor union. Uh, the second question is in uh, one of your chapter, your chapter on the veteran organizations, you talk about an Armenian soldier who was uh, you Armenian former soldier uh, who was using a Turkish name and you discussed a little bit. Can you um, talk a little bit about the ethnic politics of the, uh, the these organizations, formal and informal organizations that you talk about in your book? Sure, great questions. Um, <laughs> labor union question, uh, it made me laugh. Because you'll understand why I loved it. Um, because my, my informants basically used, so basically they would say, this guy is a PKK sympathizer or Pekekeli, or Pekakalı. And when I probe further, they would say, because he supports the, the labor union. So that for them, being a member of the labor union was equal to being a PKK sympathizer, at least for some of them. Most of them were employed in, uh, in state institutions. Uh, 
and they had a kind of distance relationship with the labor union, which is actually very tragic because when you listen to their narratives about their experiences at the workplace, etc., you see how they are in dire need of a union representation and a union struggling for their, their you know, rights at the workplace. Uh, most of them are employed as low skilled or no skilled blue collar workers. And they are given jobs that are completely incompatible with their disability status. There was one, uh, there was one acquaintance of mine in the field who had a workplace accident. Uh, he was injured from his arm uh, while he was a soldier. So he had an orthopedic injury, but he was a very muscular person. So he was given this task of dealing with really heavy stacks um, of paper. And he had a workplace accident that basically broke his spinal cord and made him a wheelchair user. Uh, so, you know, his, he, he was doubly disabled uh, and his case was used by other disabled veterans as a very clear indicator of the state's betrayal of disabled veterans, right? And you know, uh, the state disabled us kind of idea. And there you can see, I mean, like what you need is kind of a labor union struggle and representation, et cetera. Whereas there are all these politicized cleavages between how they see themselves and how they see the labor unions and what labor unions are doing. The, the case of my Armenian uh, friend in the field, Rafi Rafet, as I uh, use the pseudonym in the book, um, is a unique case. Uh, he was someone that I found uh, curious even in the first days of my fieldwork because he was someone who was a fixture of the organization, who was someone that was crucial to the day-to-day -day working of the organization, but someone who never shared the everyday jingoism that pervaded the, the association, right? Everybody, you know, used these nationalistic, jingoistic, chauvinistic language. He would refrain from them and he struck me as someone who was a humanist, a staunch humanist, who was liberal, who had all these liberal nationalist ideas. And that he made me very curious. And only later in my field work, through a very interesting story that I write in my new piece on betrayal and ethnography, uh, I learned about his, his uh, Armenian identity. Um, which he later confided with me. Um, and I always thought it as a big secret. I thought that it was a dangerous secret that he had, right? And then I heard from my other informants uh, that, oh, you know, this association, they're not nationalist enough. They're not doing enough. Look, they even have an Armenian in the midst of them. So that was used as a sign of their lack of patriotism and lack of uh, political momentum, etc. cetera. Uh, both symptom and a reason actually of their lack of political momentum and patriotism. But he was still, you know, there passing as an unmarked Turk mainly, but many people knew about his Armenianness. Uh, and that is a really, that is a really interesting, that says interesting things about how ethnicity and religion and, and more broadly alterity works in Turkey. You may have this other identity, but as long as you identify as a Turk and do not bring it up in the public sphere, etc., you may be in a kind of relatively at least safer place right you can be even or you can even operate in this 
in this official disabled veterans organization. But of course, you would pass as a Turk, right? It's like racial passing in antebellum uh, US in a way, which, you know, when I read this literature, I was very much struck by the similarities between these forms of passing. Um, and um, yeah, so in the other organizations, more informal organizations that brought together martyrs, families, and disabled veterans, this thing would not be possible. That was only possible in the official organization. Uh, so that tells about the kind of more ethnicized version of nationalism and militarism versus a little more civic, not so much, but a little more civic version of nationalism. Uh, and both are operative in Turkey and, and both the government and the state can strategically move between these two uh, sides of the spectrum. But they're always already, you know, uh, entailed within each other in a way. Thank you Sam, for elaborating on. Uh, these points are already in the book, uh, but thank you for elaborating them. Uh, are there any questions? If not, Baki, should we end our event or do you want to stay? Sure, thank you so, so much for coming. And hopefully uh, we'll see more events like this. Uh, I mean, there will be there will be WhatsApp meetings every month, that's for sure. Uh, I am planning on having one on one of the special journal issues next week, uh, next month. And then there is going to be one on um, a, one of the awards we gave earlier this year, hopefully another one. Uh, so the, the, there is one, expect one every month. Because I'm an Ottoman historian, the first things that I thought of were more about Ottoman history, but I do really look forward for receiving your suggestions for doing other things. And I'm hoping that this would become something uh, permanent, not and take us beyond the pandemic so that we could continue meeting every month. And so thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this and thank you all for coming. And thank you, Leila, Melissa and Aster for being here and Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye, Baki. Thank you again. Bye.